Welcome to Biblical Foundations, a podcast of the Center for Biblical Studies at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. I'm your co-host, Jimmy Rowe, along with Dr. Andreas Kostenberger. Join us as we discuss issues in biblical scholarship for the church. Thank you for joining us today at Biblical Foundations. Here with me is Dr. Andreas Kostenberger. Today, our guest is Dr. Michael Kruger. Dr. Kruger is president and Samuel C. Patterson Professor of New Testament and Early Christianity at Reformed Theological Seminary in Charlotte, North Carolina. He's written extensively on issues in early Christianity and the canon, including Christianity at the Crossroads, How the Second Century Shaped the Future of the Church, published by IVP Academic in 2018. Dr. Kruger, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you. Great to be with you both. Mike, uh, good to be with you. Yeah. Um, uh, you're in the Midwestern campus uh, today and tomorrow, uh, delivering the annual Sizemore Lectures. Uh, today, you discuss the questions whether church fathers inspired in the same way as Scripture. Uh, for those who weren't able to hear your lecture, can you briefly summarize your argument in your first lecture? How did the church fathers view inspiration, and did they view non-biblical writings as inspired in the same way as Scripture? Yeah, well, I decided to tackle a, a theme and a topic I've been working on for a while now, which is this intersection between inspiration and canon, which is a topic I think most evangelicals probably haven't thought of, at least in the ways that, that modern scholars are thinking of it. And I, I, I try to rebut this argument that's been prevalent for about 50 years now that the church fathers viewed their own writings as equally inspired as Scripture. And so, therefore, there was nothing about Scripture's inspiration that was anything different than the inspiration of every other source in the early Christian movement. And so in my first lecture today, I decided to, to challenge that head on, and I argued that no, um, even though similar language is used, and even though inspiration-like language is, is applied to non-scriptural sources, I argued that, that church fathers actually distinguish levels of authority and levels of inspiration. So in, in short, they're not using the words always in the same way. Mm -hmm. So they might speak of, um, of a work is inspired in a, in a more loose sense, like we might call a work of art inspired or a poem or yeah absolutely there's so many different ways they use it sometimes they talk about the inspiration of the of the of uh the holy spirit in, in as a as another way just to say the spirits at work in their midst or busy influencing and leading sometimes they use uh inspiration language to just talk about how god is behind certain truth um so that if god is in the background of something they can say that person's inspired if they're saying sure. true things. And then sometimes they they probably did attach inspiration to non-canonical books. If, if In a few rare instances, they may have been uh, confused about the boundaries of the of the canon. But but as a whole, there doesn't seem to be much that supports Kalin's idea mm -hmm. uh, and the idea of so many others that, that, that no one made distinctions about different levels of inspiration. So there's not just one technical use of inspiration the way you you and I might think of it in terms of scriptures being inspired that way, the way the say Second Timothy three sixteen uses the word. Yeah. A, so in in modern uh, theological dialogue, we we have a fairly agreed upon uh, set of words and and a fairly sort of common language about how to describe inspiration. So we would rarely hear a sermon and say that it was inspired by God, right. because in our world that word is is is, is restricted to scripture. In, in the early church, they didn't have an agreed upon set of terminology for this. So they, they, it was fluid. And it doesn't mean the concepts weren't, mm -hmm. weren't differentiated, but the words were fluid. And so they, they were more comfortable using terms like inspired um, or that God is behind it or, or that God is speaking through things, even if they didn't mean he was speaking in the same way that Scripture speaks. So. Yes, but they certainly affirmed the inspiration of Scripture the way we would today. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and if I had time in our lecture today, I would love to have rehearsed all the ways <laughs> mm -hmm. they positively do that. Right. Of course, today I was just— narrowly focused on eliminating this one objection. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yeah, very compelling case. Now, tomorrow, in your second lecture, you'll ask the follow-up question, how did the early church recognize uh, a given writing as inspired? Uh, can you give us a brief preview of the Yeah, argument? yeah. Well, today's lecture was sort of a debt-clearing exercise to set up tomorrow's lecture, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. given that there's a kind of inspiration that's distinctive to canonical books and only canonical books, which is something, of course, we already believe, the next question is, did church fathers have a way to identify those books as inspired? In other words, did they think they could know it when they saw it? Uh, and did they have a way of thinking that, that, that God would reveal such a thing? Um, and another way I phrase the question is, did, did, did church fathers think they could know a book was inspired by directly evaluating it, uh, if you will? And, and, and I, I'm going to argue, and I'm going to lean on the patristic sources for this, they did think that. They thought there was a way that that God's wor words, in some sense, uh, validate themselves, um, that there's some sense in that they're their own, they are their own best proof uh, 
for their divine origins. And so we'll get into issues like a self-authenticating mm -hmm. uh, canon and, and issues like that. And then I'll talk about that in the modern day and what we think about it and how to evaluate it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. I guess growing up Roman Catholic, um, I, I, you and I know that there's alternative proposals uh, course, as to, yeah. um, so that's that's going to be very helpful to to distinguish those mm -hmm. from from ones that are better supported by sure. pat patristic and of sources. Course, as I'll argue tomorrow uh, and make this clear, the church fathers didn't believe, nor do I personally believe that that's the only way you can know a book is from God. Um, but it is certainly a way and in, in, in maybe even the main way um, that a lot of people did. Mm -hmm. So, Well, I want to turn our attention to your book, Christianity at the Crossroads, Introduction to Second Century Christianity. I guess we can start out with the obvious question, which you begin with. What's so important about the second century when it comes to Christianity? Yeah, I find this to be a fascinating century. Um, you know, part of what I was motivated by in writing this book was just the, the lack of attention it's received by modern scholars, at least as a whole. Um, some some older scholars might remember there was actually a journal out years ago. Andreas would probably remember this called the Second Century, which tried to do its best to tackle that that time period. Although it faded away and and now was is renamed something else. But um, it's it's been often recognized as a forgotten century, an overlooked century, a century that Larry Hurtado refers to as the. Cinderella century, and <laughs> and the reason for that is probably multidimensional. No doubt that uh, for those of us in the in the guild of New Testament studies, we tend to focus on the first century. Fair enough, um, that's where all the writings are, and and then for those in the patristic world, they tend to focus on the the the, the centuries that are the most sort of compelling as far as key players and, and key literature. And so that's not the second century, right? That's going to be third and fourth and beyond. Mm -hmm. So there lurks the second, kind of stuck in the middle, and. Um, at, at the same time, despite its scholarly neglect, the other thing that I think draw, drew my attention to it is how transitional it is and how, how, how critical it is for what the future church would be. So what I argue in the book is a lot of the decisions that were made and a lot of the things that the church endured in that second century would shape it for generations to come. And so the crossroads it was at, so to speak, in the second century would, would, would determine what the church would ultimately become now in the, in, uh, the 21st century. Mm-hmm. Well, you start out the first chapter in your book, Mike, with a quote from Emily Hunt. Uh, I'm going to read the quote here. She says, uh, The second century was a rather curious period in church history. It was a time when Christians were struggling to define themselves, not only in terms of departure from their Jewish roots, but also against the Greco-Roman world around them. So what was the sociological makeup of second century Christianity, especially in view of Paul's vision in Galatians, that in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free. No, that's that's uh, that's a great question. I start intentionally with this broad um, query about who exactly were the earliest Christians. I think that's received far too little attention. Actually, mm -hmm, um, we talk a lot about what Christians believed or even what they did, um, but we don't actually talk about who they were. And so. I explore in this chapter demographically and sort of sociocultural categories, what kind of people made up the early Christian movement. Of course, we're talking about the second century here, so it looked different than it did in the first century. And you you said it right there with, with Paul's verse out of Galatians 3. I use that as a as a, as a framework. So Paul's very clear that in the, 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 the ideal, at least, is that in, in the early Christian community, there'd be neither Jew nor, nor Greek, neither, neither male nor female, neither slave nor free. And I actually work through each of those three categories and mm -hmm. talk about what that tells us about the early Christian movement. Excellent. Excellent. Um, yeah, and then um, chapter two is uh, entitled A Strange Superstition. Uh, you indicate that Christians rapidly became outcasts both politically and intellectually. So can you elaborate on the way in which Christians were increasingly marginalized or even ostracized, if not persecuted, in the wider Greco-Roman culture, and how did second-century apologists, uh, such as Justin Martyr or Tertullian, seek to make a case, an intellectual case for Christianity? Yeah, this was a fun chapter to write. It was illuminating in many ways um, in terms of the status of Christianity in the early centuries. And in the second century, what began to happen is Christianity grew enough, at least, and had enough impact that the Greco-Roman world began to take notice. Um, and as they did, they didn't like what they saw. <laughs> they, uh, they were actually uh, quite hostile to Christianity, as is well known. Um, I think particularly uh, here of the, of the uh, uh, letter to the emperor written by Pliny the Younger, who was a governor in Bithynia at the time. And he mm -hmm. writes to Trajan and complains about the Christians. And uh, 
What's interesting is his complaint about the Christians is multidimensional. I mean, one of the things, you know, even mentioning the chapter we just talked about a second ago, he mentions how Christians were from all ranks of society, all sexes, uh, cutting across sociocultural lines in an unprecedented manner, which was quite unique to Christianity in the ancient world. I mean, it wasn't always the case that religions were so transnational, and, and certainly Judaism wasn't. Mm-hmm. And so Christianity was unique in the sense that it cut across all these lines. But but Pliny's concern was even different than that. His concern was that that Christians had become a threat of some sort. They were they were uh, sort of in modern terms a national security threat. As strange as that sounds to us, you think what are these <laughs> poor little Christians doing that's got you so nervous? And mm. it was very clear to him that that they had disrupted the social fabric of the Roman Empire by their failure to worship the Roman gods. Um, and in our world, that seems so weird because we think, well, why would you care who? Christians worshipped or didn't worship, but for for Rome to worship the Romans mm-hmm. God, Roman gods was to was to be a faithful citizen of Rome that 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 made sure the gods blessed Rome and and, and showed her favor. And for the Christians to not re- worship the Roman gods was a way of saying they just flaunt the the good of the Roman people and don't care. And so for Pliny, he he felt like Christians were were derelict in their duty as good citizens and undercutting the the health and prosperity of the empire. And that's just one example mm-hmm. of the way Christians were perceived. They were, they were perceived as, you know, undermining and seditious. They were seen as as, as a destabilizing effect. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, merely, and this is this is a stunning reality. Merely because they refused to worship uh, the the cultural deities, and I think there's mm-hmm. a great lesson for us today in that in that reality. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, that that's what strikes me. How relevant. Uh, uh, the, your study of, of second century Christianity is, and also reminds me of some of the things that we already read in the pages of the New, of the New Testament, whether it's uh, you know in Revelation on 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 uh, all the uh, the persecution of, on on uh, inflicted on on the early Christians for refusing to worship the emperor. You oh think yeah, First uh, mm-hmm. Peter, right? The 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 language of of Christians as resident aliens who are. Uh, Trying to witness to the culture, um, and uh, you know other similar uh, passages uh, where you Act seventeen, Paul basically, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there uh, uh, being opposed and, and 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 not gaining much of a got much traction. Uh, people look at him as a seed picker, as as, <laughs> as somebody who's kind of eclectic, who, who they couldn't easily fit into any of the existing philosophical schools. So, right, right. so you see the uneasiness and the, uh, the you know, the the, the 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 way in which Christians kind of stuck out and didn't comfortably fit in into the culture. Yeah, that's right. They they were oddities almost at every turn, and certainly their lack of of worshiping the gods was an oddity. And there's other things that made them oddities. Um, the, the idea that, that 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 Christians were were so exclusive was a problem, but also the idea that Christians were were committed to this book or books that made them uh, focused on the Old Testament scriptures and even their New Testament writings. That was strange because that's not what the religions of the Greco Roman world did. They they weren't interested in books so much. They were interested more in ritual. And so Christians were odd there as well. And so it was just one thing after another that they had stacked against them. And mm-hmm. so that, that, you know, we, we were, were well aware of the, the critiques in that time period. It wasn't just plenty. You know, it was certainly famously it was a Celsus's critique against the, the, the Christians that was pretty, pretty harsh and pretty cruel. Um, and then Galen and, and others were all sort of out to get them intellectually. And so that was a, mm-hmm. that was a challenge. Mm-hmm. In uh, chapter three, um, you de- deal with developments in church leadership, the rise of the, the bishop, plurality of elders, house churches. Uh, what do we know about second century Christian worship, teaching, gatherings, um, meals? And uh, how did these practices differ from, say, first century Christian practice, especially in the area of church leadership? Yeah, this was another fascinating uh, segment of early Christianity that I was was keen to study and, and found it to be illuminating on so many levels was this this issue of what did the worship service look like for early Christians? What 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 what, did, what would it look like to go to church, so to speak, on a Sunday morning, if you want to say it that way? Um, and and how did churches relate to each other? And and who led them? Um, these are all really actually what we would call practical questions mm-hmm. because in our our current day, those are still very important issues, you know. Mm-hmm. And and people want to know, well, did the early church look like my church? And and so forth. And, and, and the general answer is in many ways it did and in some ways it didn't. But uh, I tackle a number of things in this chapter. One, of course, is church leadership. I did argue for, and I think there's great evidence for, a great amount of, of uh, 
cooperation and unity and interaction among earliest Christians. Now, how you know, parsing that out in its details is fuzzy, but there, there's no doubt that, that the early Christian movement was not in isolation from each other so that they never were, were, were seen as a unit. So what would often happen is a church would be seen as the church in that city, even though it had multiple congregations. So you'd have a, the church at Rome or the church at Corinth, even though there was multiple house churches within the city. And that was a fascinating reality. So somehow they viewed themselves as connected, even though they probably had individual uh, elders or pastors, so to speak, in those congregations and probably met separately. That was a that that was a fascinating uh, thing to observe. But the thing that stuck out the most to me, I think, uh, and I would be curious what you all think in terms of the, the curious observations there, is just how similar the worship service was in the second century as it was today. I mean, you know, if you think, what do you do in a worship service today? Well, actually, the same thing they're doing two thousand years ago. You you have the, the the preaching of the word. You have prayer. You have music. You have the 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 the, the so, sort of uh, the sacraments of Last Supper mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and baptism. You mm-hmm. have this sense of a gathering. It's remarkably similar and really hasn't changed much in its in its particulars for for two thousand years. And that's 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 a very encouraging thing. Mm. Excellent. Yeah, that's very encouraging. I'm glad you you keep bringing up just how relevant um, a study of second century Christianity is still for us uh, today. And you know, along those lines. Uh, Chapter 4 deals with the important topic of diversity in uh, early Christianity. Uh, you and I co-wrote a book um, on this topic, The Heresy of Orthodoxy. Uh, the German scholar Walter Bauer, in his book, Heresy and Orthodoxy in Earliest Christianity, uh, famously argued that early Christianity was diverse. There were multiple versions of Christianity, uh, none of which could lay legitimate claim to being the undisputed form of Christianity, at least not in the first century or even the second for the most part. And uh, in our book, as you know, we argue against the uh, so-called power thesis that that the New Testament uh, makes clear that the early Christians were very much unified around the uh, apostolic gospel of Jesus crucified, buried, and risen according to the scriptures, as Paul summarizes it in 1 Corinthians 15. And so uh, fascinating for me to hear you articulate uh, some sort of a follow-up question. What light does the second century mm-hmm. shed on this question of the diversity of early Christianity? And can you uh, maybe even give some examples such as the Ebionites or the the Marcionites, the Gnostics? Other? Yeah. No, thank you. That that was a fun chapter to write. Obviously, it builds a lot on our work together, which was exciting, and 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 builds off of that question: What do we do with Walter Bauer's thesis? Mm-hmm. And those are all important things. And so, actually, chapters four and five deal with yeah. the same problem from a different angle. So, in, in essence, what I argue is that is that Bauer was kind of right, but mostly wrong. Was <laughs> effectively my <laughs> argument. And chapter four is the kind of right part, which is Bauer was correct on one thing. And that is Christianity in the second century did have, you know, alternate pathways and diversity out there. And there were fringe groups and there was heresies and, and, you know, those things existed. And, and what I think is helpful about chapter four is that I imagine most modern Christians may not know that. And they, they do need to know that, that, you know, there was a little bit of a battle going on there mm-hmm. and, the, and the church was fighting for its life and they need to understand these different groups. And as you mentioned, um, we cover a lot of those and there's so many different factions within uh, the uh, sort of diverse world of early Christianity that I just mentioned a few groups, one of which, of course, is the Ebionites. Uh, this was sort of a Jewish Christian sect who uh, identified with Christ but still held on to the old ways of Judaism and, and fashions that that made them very much sort of still beholden to circumcision and the Mosaic law in a way that most Christians would not have recognized. Um, and so these were these tended to be um, you know, law keepers in a way that maybe even would have been identified with the circumcision party of sorts. Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side uh, from the Ebionites was the Marcionites, which would have been the opposite. Mm -hmm. The Marcionites would have been pretty much um, Old Testament's bad. Um, We know that Marcion famously attributed it to a different God, actually. So the creator God and the God who who wrote the Old Testament were not the God of the New Testament or the God of Jesus. Um, and so he he draws a radical separation between the old and the new, whereas the Ebionites tried to fuse them together in ways that we'd probably be uncomfortable with today. So he actually ditched the Old Testament. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. The, per my lecture earlier today, <laughs> yes. you know, uh, there is still a Marcionite <laughs> trend in certain circles today. Sadly, even though people probably mm-hmm. wouldn't call it that, where where even if not 
in reality, at least in practice, people mm -hmm. really try to avoid the Old Testament and consider it to be a problem. And in as much as we, we we're that way, we, yeah. we are falling into the same trap again. Uh, yeah. as Marcy I guess again. even ditch uh, New Testament books that use the Old Testament. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. and then you know I mentioned the Gnostics too in, yeah. in that chapter. And of course, there it's a it's a very interesting question of what is Gnosticism exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a big dif dispute, of course, on the definition of it and whether it's even a thing. But there's a certain sense in which I think we can draw out certain principles of Gnosticism that uh, were true in the ancient world, a, a downplaying of the physical uh, and, a, and a rejection of the body of sorts, a, a recasting of the work of Christ uh, that's more about illumination and enlightenment than, than, than salvation from our sins. Right. And those, those sound eerily like a lot of religious movements today. Thank you for joining us today at Biblical Foundations. For more information, please visit the Center for Biblical Studies at Midwestern at cbs.mbts.edu. For further resources, please also visit biblicalfoundations.org. Please join us again next time at the Biblical Foundations podcast.